Once a month or so, we invite couples counselor and sex therapist Dr. David McKenzie to come to Studio 4 to talk about relationships and all they entail. Today, he's interested in the role the brain plays in the love connection. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. David McKenzie to Studio 4, back to Studio 4, to tell us more. Hi, Fanny. Nice to see you. Yes, good to see you. So, uh, does the heart or the brain fall in love, or do you know? They don't know, but I have my own suspicions as a psychotherapist. A new study has just come out, a meta-analysis uh, led by uh, Stephanie Ortiz at Syracuse University, a team of researchers. And it shows that um, the event or the feeling of falling in love takes place in one-fifth of a second. And that 12 areas of the brain are affected. And that uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, adrenaline, or norepinephrine mm -hmm. are secreted. Also, oxytocin, which is actually a hormone but acts like a neurotransmitter. Right. And these are all euphoria creating uh, mm. chemicals in the brain. Uh, she claims that it's uh, similar to being on cocaine. I've never done cocaine, so I don't know. But well, I know I'm not it, talking. <laughs> but I know <laughs> what it is to be in love. Mm. But um, anyways, it's interesting in this study because uh, it's showing that certain areas of the brain are affected it, with certain kinds of emotions. For instance, the feeling of bonding with a child and that deep parental love mm -hmm. affects much deeper parts of the brain. I'm suspecting more primitive areas. Whereas the feeling of falling in love affects the more higher functioning cognitive areas. I'm suspecting more the frontal part of the brain. Oh. Now, another study was done a year ago, which showed uh, that men, if they're in the presence of a woman they consider beautiful, or if they fall in love, will become tongue-tied. They'll be gaga, they won't know how to formulate their words, because it totally uh, mixes up their ability to cognate. And do women become tongue-tied too, oh, and sure. get mixed up, so it's not just a male thing? No, this was only a it's study a human of males, thing. So it's a human thing, I would suspect. Okay, yeah. so, uh, uh, love is a good drug. Well, uh, yes, it's, it's an interesting drug. It only lasts for about three months. Because That's then the you, problem. <laughs> you become immune to the chemicals that are mm. being, you know. But um, a question was asked of, uh, of uh, Dr. Ortiz, uh, is it the heart or the brain that mm. falls in love? And she said, well, we haven't figured that out. Now, from a psychological standpoint, psychology says that the, the feeling of falling in love is actually a form of projection. Let me explain what projection is, according to Jungian thinking. Um, have you ever met somebody and within five or ten minutes you just don't like that person? Mm -hmm. What Jungian psychology says is that there are parts of yourself that you cannot, you don't like, that you repress, that you're not aware of. So uh, subconsciously we take these things and we project them onto a person that we really don't know. Mm. But within 10 minutes we just instinctively don't like them. It's because we're projecting onto them parts of ourself we don't like. So what I don't like about you, I don't like about myself. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, I mean, unless I'm an axe Perhaps. murderer or something, you know. Yes. <laughs> God forbid. That's explainable. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. But, so the act of falling in love, uh, there are deep imprints within us, in our nurture, even in our nature, of what the ideal mate should be. So the feeling of falling in love is actually triggering those, and we project it onto the person. That's why it's really true to say love is blind. Mm -hmm. We often can't see the whole person. Well, the first stage seems to me to be lust mm -hmm. or it's it's so instant as you as mm -hmm. you said one fifth of a second yeah. and I don't know if it's lust so much <laughs> as you just think wow <laughs> yeah. and it's uh, something unexplainable really yeah because you could be on the bus and, and sit beside somebody and you see them yeah. they talk to you and you're attracted That's immediately right. and you can be on the bus beside <laughs> a million others yes, and not feel a tingle. That's right, that's right. And that one person singles it out. An old girlfriend of mine decades ago said, have you ever engaged in car romances? I said, what's mm. that? Oh, it's looking in the mirror and giving the eye to somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time she said that she actually fell for this guy just looking into the eye. Strange, I've never yes, done that. Yes, that is a bit strange, but <laughs> I, I understand it. Across yeah. a crowded room, there yeah. was a study done uh, of running into your ex. Mm. After 40 years, mm -hmm. somebody maybe you went out with when you were 18, sure. and the, the energy is palpable. Yep. Uh, you both have to take a breath, step back, because it's still there. Sure it is. After sure it all is. those years, well, what the heck's that, the brain or the heart? I, well, I think it's the psyche. Um, I think it's also the brain. I think they both work in tandem. Uh, you've heard Jim Groce's song, uh, Never Heard It yes. Said Before, that kids can't fall in love and feel the same. You bet they can. Right. And uh, it starts even at 12 and 13 years of age of a child falling in love. Mm -hmm. So you start out with lust, and then yeah. you become attracted. 
Well, you, or you, not. I don't know. You, you can have a lust. Yeah. I well, I don't know about you, but I can have a lust, sure. and I bet you can too. I wouldn't. And then you don't. I wouldn't it, equate it, falling in love with lust. No, I agree because yeah. it it peters out sometimes. Yeah. You think, oh wow, yeah. and about um, two days in, you think, oh not so wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening in your brain? Yeah. Uh, well, um, I, I, that's where I think psychology comes into it. Mm. As we start to get a bigger picture and analyze in our thinking and maybe experience the person in different arenas of life, we start to take a different take on that individual. But um, in all of these things, I mean, it, there's a short shelf life. Uh, Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled, yes. says that um, nature has equipped us with falling in love. We're naturally self-centered. So we have this emotion which overcomes us to kick us out of our self-centeredness in order to attach and procreate the human race. Without that, there'd be no mm -hmm. procreation. Right. So you're, you, you lust a bit, you become attracted, and then you get to a, a stage where you actually want to be attached mm -hmm. sure. in some way. Mm -hmm. Move in with marry, yeah. just be around a lot. They're in your mind all the time. That's right. That's all the right. time, all the time. That's right. That's right. What's and that, that about? Well, it's, it's That's part, the brain. It has to be. It, it's the brain. No, the brain is involved in all of this. The question becomes, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Mm -hmm. Is the psyche uh, triggering the brain's chemicals or are the brain's chemicals triggering the psyche? I think it's a combination of both. I tend to weigh more on the psyche. What about that warm feeling? If, you, if you're crazy <laughs> about someone, you know, and you're yeah. not with them, yeah. and you think about them, yeah. you get that warm feeling, yeah. it makes you happy, yeah. you can be having a rotten day, That's right. and you think about them, That's right. and as, you get a thrill. As long as they feel the same way about you. If they don't uh, feel the same way, it can be torture. That. <laughs> yes, and what does happen to the brain? Do you think when somebody falls out of love, uh, mm. on a certain day maybe, mm. just no yeah. more. Well, you, there's, a problem, there's a problem with that. I always say in, in my writing and in my uh, counsel that at about the three or four months, uh, you will lose that feeling of being in love. Sure. And the some, euphoria, and, you mean. Yeah. And, and, or limerence. Some couples will think, oh, no, I've fallen out of love. No, no, that's an essential stage to go through that because then the deep attachment and formation begins. The walls of the ego assert themselves and you negotiate how you're going to live with each other. It's a necessary mm -hmm. stage. And these are same-sex marriage same-sex relationships, uh, hetero relationships, yeah, yeah, doesn't matter. Apply. Where does sex fit into this? What if you met somebody, uh, were crazy about them, became attached to them, never had sex with them? Can it last? Oh, sure it can last. I mean, there are sexless couples who are perfectly happy with each other. Uh, I tend to believe, like George Bernard Shaw, that pl platonic love is platonic nonsense. I think sexuality informs every aspect of our life. And uh, even if uh, we're not that in touch with it, I think there are elements of our sexuality which inform everything. Mm. I, mean, I do too, but I read this little article, and mm -hmm. of course I don't know who wrote it, so I'm not sure how true it is, that the more sex a man has with a woman, the closer they, a male is to the female. The yep. more sex, the more frequent sex. Mm -hmm. Now all men will, will love to hear that. Yeah. Well, is it true? Yes, I believe it is. And one of the uh, things I've noticed clinically is that uh, when men are not getting regular sex with their partners, they start to feel very unloved. Whereas women, as the old saying goes, really need to feel the emotional connection, uh, a partner that opens up to them, talks to them, and then they will, mm -hmm. out of that center, feel sexual. Sure, uh, a partner that treasure, who treasures them. Yes, of course, and, and where there's safety them. and there's nesting, yes, mm -hmm. all of that. Very much so. Yeah, whereas as men are much more visual, I mean, men want the same thing women do. They want loyalty, they want love, they want depth of commitment. Uh, but the initial strikes, men are very visual. And that's just the way males mm -hmm. have evolved. But as a female sits around and talks to, to another female and says, how do you keep uh, your man in the pen, in the house, happy? Mm -hmm. Would you say sex is at the top or uh, love at the top or I admire you at the top? What's at the top? <sighs> or does it depend on the man? I think a lot of it depends on the man. There are men out there, um, uh, Fanny, who are getting all the sex they want at home, and yet they're still going out behind their partner's backs, mm. seeking sex, having affairs. Uh, there are other men who hardly get any sex at home, and yet they're faithful and loyal, and their only sexual outlet is probably masturbating in front of the, the, the screen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a, a lot of it depends on where the individual is coming from. There's no doubt that in a sexless marriage where there's sexual starvation of either one, there's going to be a temptation to step out of the marriage. Okay, but sometimes, and we've talked about this before, it is how I feel 
when I'm with you. Yes. It's, I guess we could say it's how you make me feel, but we know it's really about us. That's right. But when I'm with this person, I feel fabulous. Sure. I feel adored sure. and lovely, sure. e even if he doesn't adore me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's <laughs> all know? within our skin. But it's something. Yeah, it's all within our skin. Mm -hmm. And that partner or person is triggering all sorts of things. That's why um, emotional intelligence is important in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Because not just with feeling good, if uh, something our partner does triggers memories within us of our past, we start responding to the memories instead of to our partner. Sure. Is, so do you believe there is a science to falling in love? Oh, yeah, sure there is. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, they even, uh, in one experiment, I actually saw it on a TV documentary, they took about five shirts from different males, had them work out in them, and the sweat from those t-shirts were put in jars. They had a number of women sit and smell those t-shirts and, um, and describe the kind of man they liked. It's interesting that the women who found the t-shirt they were most turned on with actually matched the kind of a man they drew or that they talked about. Really? Yeah, it was fascinating. What about familiarity? And by that I mean we have a type. Mm -hmm. uh, so does our brain say, that's my kind of guy? Absolutely. Tall, dark, handsome, yeah. or uh, blonde, brown-eyed, chubby? Much more with men than women. Mm. Uh, women, I mean, I've seen women, uh, and Heather Remoff in her work has shown this, uh, females will look at a man and say, what a nerd. I mean, oh man, I could never go out with a guy like that. Then they fall in love with his brain. Then they get attached to him. And the guy in their minds actually becomes a hunk. Mm. Not so for a male as much. Uh, the core erotic theme is set in a person by about 16 years of age. So if you're automatically attracted to narrow faces, even if you're with a wide face, you still have that core erotic theme. Okay, so a man uh, sees a woman, not, doesn't find her that attractive. Yeah. She opens her mouth. Mm -hmm. He listens to the tone and speed of her voice, mm -hmm. uh, watches her body language, mm -hmm. uh, and what, what she actually says, he likes. Sure. Does that turn him on? It does, but not, the same, <laughs> yeah, not in the same way as women. And this is where a lot of females and even female therapists don't get male sexuality. So they'll say, oh, he's a shallow man because I'm 80 pounds overweight. He should love me for who I am. Mm -hmm. A female may think that way. A male doesn't because the visual is very tied in to how a male sees a partner. And yet some men love big women. Oh, yeah. No, my, I got a friend who just loves huge women. Yeah. So, um, I mean, no, no. I, it's, it's your core erotic that's theme. A, that's good to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm, and men who don't like women who are too skinny. That's right. But that, it's so much about our parts at some level. <laughs> it's kind of depressing. <laughs> but, you know, hey. uh, you'll hear a male say, oh, I'm a leg guy. Yeah. Or... You know? Yeah, well, uh, women tend to study faces more, whereas men look a little lower to study. Mm -hmm. and, or higher, yeah, yeah. as the case may be. <laughs> so in the romance novels, mm -hmm. yeah. sexual chemistry abounds, yeah. as you know. Yeah. But it's about more than that. It has to be. Of course it is. And the reason why mostly women read these is because it has that element of connecting and romance. Mm -hmm. Although a study done in Vienna, uh, I think I may have mentioned it, uh, of, I think it was 3,000 women, they let them read erotic stories composed by women right. and explicit media, uh, pornography. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of the women said the stories were in the end boring, but the explicit media turned them on. Okay. Interesting. So what is going on? You're 35, you're 45, you're 85. Mm -hmm. No romance. Mm -hmm. You're attractive, you're at the, working at the top of your game. Nothing is happening in, in the romance department. You're mm -hmm. not feeling like you want to fall in love mm -hmm. and you simply aren't falling in you love. You you're not with a partner or you're with You're not a with a partner. Okay. You're single. Yeah. There are many single 35-year-old sure. women and 35-year-old guys. Yeah. They can't find someone. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going on in our heads or our psyche? Mm. Are we causing that or is it just a lack of men or women or what? It's a number of variables. One of the things I have found is that uh, with women, they will choose partners who are unavailable or who will cheat on them. Likely they're choosing those based on their childhood experience, which reinforces their feeling that all men are creeps and all men are bad. So then they become very jaded and they set up standards higher than angels can keep so no man can meet those. Okay, the trust factor. Yeah, but the, the feeling comfortable. Uh, with males, it can happen the same way. But uh, oftentimes I find with males there is this fear of commitment. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Uh, but there is this sense that somebody else may come down the line which will be more attractive to me. Not all men think that way. Please right. don't get me wrong. I'm thinking of those that have trouble at 35 and 40. They still haven't been in a long-term mm -hmm. relationship. And may never be.
What hurdle do I they have to get over? <laughs> well, I hold out yeah. hope too, but yeah. uh, I know a few who are 65 or 70 who yeah. are still aren't. Yeah. They I, have many adventures. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Well, I mean, uh, avenge, I mean, my, my bias, I guess, and maybe it comes from my background as a priest, mm -hmm. uh, which I left long ago, but that uh, we develop in community and that promiscuity by men or women is eventually an emotional wasteland. So that all of us really wants to have one partner to pair off with and have a deep relationship. The trouble is we end up sabotaging what we crave mm. for a variety of reasons. If a person at 35, 40 just cannot get into a long-term relationship and wants that, I think it's time to seek some professional counseling and help. Okay, because they do say they want it. I'm looking for the right one. I'm always looking for the right one. I right. have not met the right one. Yeah, they probably have. Um, I had, a, I had a, a very attractive woman about four years ago, very attractive, uh, highly educated, come into my office. And she was living with a biker who was not very good looking, slapped her around, never worked. And um, she was not attracted at all to very good looking men who were loyal and earned money. And it all went back to her childhood and her own father. She keeps repeating a bad pattern. Mm. Gee, repeat and repeat. Yeah. Nice to see you Always again. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. David McKenzie. And coming up, we meet an award-winning sommelier who's off to Whistler's Cornucopia this weekend, Curtis Colt. We'll drive up the sea to Sky to sample and judge some great global grapes. Stay with us for a preview.